Hi, welcome to Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to introduce the steepest ascent method and Newton method for solving unconstrained optimization problems. These two methods are very different in character, and we're going to compare and contrast their relative advantages and disadvantages. We first consider the simpler case of unconstrained optimization. And perhaps the simplest method for unconstrained optimization is steepest ascent. And the key idea behind steepest ascent is that the negative gradient minus grad of x points in the steepest downhill direction for f at x. And therefore, we could devise an iterative method for minimizing f by following minus grad f of x k at each step k. However, this motivates a question. How far should we go in the direction of minus grad f of x k? And we can try to find the best step size by solving a subsidiary and easier optimization problem. And for a direction s in Rn, let the function phi from r to r be given by phi of eta is equal to f of x plus eta times s. Then minimizing f along s corresponds to minimizing the one-dimensional scalar function phi. And the process of minimizing f along a line is called a line search. Putting these pieces together, we end up with the following algorithm for the steepest ascent method. We choose an initial guess, x0, and then we perform iterations over k from 0, 1, 2, and so on. We set sk equal to minus grad f of xk, and we then choose eta k to minimize f of xk plus eta k sk, and we then set our next step, xk plus 1, equal to xk plus eta k sk. And this is a workable optimization method. And one useful feature of steepest ascent is that we're guaranteed to always improve and find a smaller value of f at each iteration. Unfortunately, however, steepest ascent can converge very slowly. And the convergence rate is linear, and the scaling factor can be arbitrarily close to 1. And we'll now take a look at a Python example that will demonstrate some of these difficulties. We'll now demonstrate the steepest ascent method. And to do so, we'll make use of the Himmelblau function, which is a common benchmark function used for testing optimization approaches. And the Himmelblau function is a polynomial of two variables, x and y, and features terms up to the fourth power. And I'm showing a three-dimensional plot of the Himmelblau function here. And if we rotate around this plot, then we see that there are four isolated local minima that are shown by the red patches. And in between these four local minima, there's a single isolated local maximum. If we move away from these local minima in any direction outside of the plotting range that's shown here, then the function values start to increase rapidly in all directions. We can calculate the positions of the local minima analytically, and we find that the function value is equal to zero at all four local minima. The single local maximum is located at minus 0.27, 0.92, and the function value is 181.6 there. So we'll now take a look at finding these local minima using the steepest ascent method. We're going to make use of the Himmelblau function to test several different optimization methods, and I've therefore written a separate program called Himmelblau.py that implements the Himmelblau function, its gradient, and also its Hessian. And for the steepest ascent method, we'll just require the function and its gradient. When we come to look at some other optimization approaches, such as the Newton method later on in this video, then we'll also require the Hessian. So now let's look at the program h underscore sdescent.py that implements the steepest ascent method. And we'll begin by importing the Himmelblau function from the other file. We'll define the maximum number of iterations to perform, 
and we'll also define a tolerance on the absolute step size that we'll use to determine when to terminate the algorithm. A key part of the steepest descent method is to perform line searches where we restrict our function to one-dimensional cross sections and I'll define a function here called r underscore line that is a scalar function of a parameter eta and it will evaluate the Himmelblau function along a one-dimensional cross section centered at x and y in the direction of the negative gradient of the function given by gx and gy. We'll then define the steepest ascent algorithm and in this function we'll take in our initial position x and y, our function and also its gradient and we'll perform a number of iterations and at each step we'll perform a line search using the scipy.optimize.minimize routine applied to our r underscore line function. And after this, we'll print out the current position, x and y, the gradient of the function, gx and gy, the function value, and also the line search parameter. And we'll then update our solution and we'll check if we've reached the convergence criterion. So we're going to first demonstrate the steepest descent method starting from an initial position of minus one comma one. So let me now go ahead and run the program. So for this case we see rapid convergence and after 11 iterations we can see that the function values have decreased to 2.4 times 10 to the minus 19 which suggests that we're very close to one of the local minima of the Himmelblau function. So let me now run this program again and save the results to a temporary file called sd1.dat. So the convergence properties of steepest descent can be heavily dependent on our initial position. And to demonstrate this, let me now try a different initial position where I start from minus point one six one four nine comma one and if i now run the steepest descent method again then in this case i see that many more iterations are required to reach convergence and let me now run this program again and save these results to a temporary file called sd2.dat And I'm now going to take a look at plotting the progression of the steepest descent method for these two cases. So let me first plot the contours of the Himmelblau function. And I previously created the contours in a file called h underscore contour dot dat. So the contours are shown in different colors of blue with darker shades of blue indicating larger values of the Himmelblau function. And we can see the four isolated local minima of the function, and we can also see the single local maximum of the function that's in between the minima. So now let me add the two steepest ascent paths to this plot. So the red curve here shows the first case that we looked at where we had rapid convergence to a local minimum. The magenta case shows the second example. And we can see a number of interesting features. We can see that after a few steps, the steepest descent method ended up taking a very large step and ended up then finding a local minimum that was actually rather far away from our starting point. And this is a typical feature of steepest ascent. 
and we can see that for this particular one-dimensional cross-section at this particular point in the algorithm the cross-section aligned in such a way with the landscape of the function that this point over here was indeed the local minimum. So this unpredictable behavior can sometimes happen with steepest ascent. Another feature we can also see in this plot is how we have the rather slow convergence of the steepest ascent method for this second case. And we can see this zigzagging behavior as we approach the local minimum. And to look at this in more detail, I'm going to now alter the axes to zoom in on this region of the algorithm results. So we can see how we end up taking this zigzagging path. And if we look at this point right here, then we can see that at this point, the gradient does indeed point in this direction, which will be perpendicular to the contour. So everything makes sense. However, because the gradient points in this direction, we end up rather far away from the actual direction that we would like to move in to reach this local minimum. And this type of zigzagging behavior is actually rather common in the steepest ascent method. And because we restrict ourselves to this one dimensional optimization problem, we can often end up missing out on a better direction to go in. So let's now evaluate the convergence properties of these two trials quantitatively. So I'm now going to plot the Euclidean norm of the gradient of f as a function of the number of iterations that have been performed. And I'm going to make use of semi-log axes. So when we use semi-log axes, then we see that the Euclidean norm follows a straight line, and that is indicative of a linear convergence rate for this algorithm, as we expected. This means that every step of the algorithm, we're lowering the error by a constant factor. So one thing we can notice here is that uh, there are some initial transients in the behavior. And we can see that the Euclidean norm of gradient can actually increase on some of the initial steps. And this is definitely possible. Let's now look at a second measure of convergence where we just look at the function values themselves. So if we just look at the function values, then again, we see the linear convergence rate. However, here we can actually see that the convergence is monotonic. And this is what we would expect for the steepest ascent method. Because we are moving always in the direction of the negative gradient, then we're guaranteed to always find a better result at each step of the algorithm. And this is a very nice feature of the steepest ascent method. And it means that under certain conditions, we can guarantee that the method will converge to a local minimum. In our example, we saw that steepest ascent converges reliably. However, in some situations, the convergence rate can be rather slow. And one of the reasons for this is that steepest ascent only makes use of very limited information about our function f. At each step, we're only making use of an instantaneous measurement of grad f in order to advance the next step. And we can get faster convergence by using more information about our function f. And one way to approach this is to look at our optimality condition for a stationary point where we know that grad f of x star is equal to zero. And this is a system of nonlinear equations. And therefore, we can solve it with quadratic convergence using Newton's method. 
And to do this, we'll need the Jacobian of grad f, and that will be equal to the Hessian of f. And hence, we can write down an algorithm for Newton's method for unconstrained optimization as follows. We'll choose an initial guess x0, and then we'll perform steps k from 0, 1, 2, and so on. And each step k will evaluate the linear system h f of x k times s k is equal to minus grad f of x k, and we'll solve for s k. And then we'll advance the next step using x k plus 1 is equal to x k plus s k. And it's worth noting that in its current form, Newton's method will find all stationary points of our function f. And if we were interested in local minima only, then we would have to classify our stationary points according to the Hessian into local minima, local maxima, and saddle points. We can also interpret Newton's method as seeking a stationary point based on a sequence of local quadratic approximations. And let's suppose that delta is a small vector. Then we could perform a second order Taylor series expansion of our function f at x in delta, and we could define this to be a quadratic q of delta. And we could find a stationary point of q in the usual way. We could write down grad q of delta, and that would be equal to grad f of x plus h f of x times delta, and we want to set that equal to zero. And that would lead to h f of x times delta is equal to minus grad f of x. And that would exactly match the step in the algorithm on our previous slide. So to illustrate this, let's look at the following one-dimensional function. And suppose we started at a point x0, shown here. Then if we evaluated the first and second derivative of our function there, then we could construct a quadratic approximation to our function. And we could then define our next step, x1, as the stationary point of this quadratic. We could repeat this procedure to find our next step, x2. And we can see that as we approach the minimum of this function, then our approximation of the function as a parabola will become more and more accurate and therefore will have rapid convergence to the local minimum. So now let's take a look at a Python example of Newton's method applied to our previous example function f, and let's compare the results to the steepest descent method. Let's now revisit our Himmelblau function example and look at using Newton's method to find the local minima. And on the left here, I'm showing contours of the Himmelblau function, and I'm also showing the two previous solutions that we found using the steepest ascent method for comparison. The program hnewton.py implements Newton's method for optimization, and at the start of this program, we'll import the Himmelblau function, its gradient, and its Hessian from the common file. We'll then specify a starting point for Newton's method, and I've chosen the point of minus 2.8 comma minus 3.5, that puts us close to the minimum in the lower left. We'll then perform the Newton iterations and we'll keep on doing so until the step size falls below a tolerance of 10 to the minus 12 in Euclidean norm. In each iteration, we'll solve a linear system involving the Hessian and the gradient of the Himmelblau function and we'll also print out the current position and the function value there. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And as expected, we see very rapid convergence to a solution. In particular, if we look at the third column of values, which show the function at each current position in the Newton iteration, then we see that the exponents are 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 13, 10 to the minus 28. And this rough doubling of the exponents is consistent with the quadratic convergence that we expect for Newton's method. 
So let me now run this program again and save the results to a temporary file called sd3.dat. And for comparison, I'll also run Newton's method again, but starting from a different initial position of 5,5. And again, we see rapid convergence to a solution with exponents of 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 14, 10 to the minus 28, indicating the quadratic convergence rate. So let me run this program again and save the results to a temporary file called sd4.dat. So I'll now plot the progression of the solutions on top of the plot on the left. And we can see that the solutions look different from the previous steepest ascent solutions. If we look at the black solution in the top right, then we can see that we have rapid convergence to this local minimum in the top right. And unlike the steepest ascent method that typically features this zigzagging path toward our local minimum, we can see that in the Newton method, we curve and head directly toward the local minimum in just a few steps. And this is one advantage with using the information in the Hessian where the method is able to take into account the local curvature of the function to obtain better solution guesses at each step. Another feature that we can see in the bottom left is that the first step of the Newton method in this case actually overshot the local minimum by quite a large amount before then recovering and heading toward the local minimum rapidly. And this is not something that we would expect with the steepest ascent method. So let's now look at the convergence rates uh, quantitatively. And so I'm now going to look at a semi-log plot where I look at the function value in terms of the number of iterations for both the steep ascent method and the Newton method. And so we can see that the Newton method converges much more rapidly than the steep ascent method. And unlike the steep ascent method where we see the linear convergence rate, we can see the much more rapid convergence rate with Newton from the quadratic convergence. Let me now adjust the axis ranges to focus on the first few steps of these iterations. And one interesting feature that we can see in the Newton method is that on the first iteration of the solve that started from minus 2.8 and minus 3.5, the function value will actually increase and that corresponds to the overshooting that we saw in the previous plot. And that is a typical feature of the Newton method and is a disadvantage compared to Steeper's Ascent. With Steeper's Ascent, we always know that we are going to improve our solution at every step. And because of this feature of the Newton method, it means that we can only guarantee convergence when we're close to a local minimum and we don't have the same robustness as we have with the steepest ascent method. As we saw in the example, Newton's method generally converges much faster than steepest ascent. However, Newton's method can be unreliable, particularly if we start far away from a solution. In addition, when we take a step from xk to xk plus 1, then with steepest ascent we're guaranteed that our function value will decrease in size. However, with Newton's method, our function value can actually increase from one step to the next. To improve the robustness during the early iterations, it's common to perform a line search in the Newton step direction. And in addition, the line search can ensure that we don't approach a local maximum, 
as can happen with the original Newton method. And since the line search modifies the Newton step size, this is often referred to as a damped Newton method. Another way to improve robustness is using trust region methods. And each iteration k, we compute a trust radius rk. And this determines a region surrounding xk on which we trust our quadratic Taylor series approximation. And we require that as we take a step from xk to xk plus 1, the size of that step has to be less than or equal to rk. And hence, we can solve a constrained optimization problem with a quadratic objective function at each step. The size of rk plus 1 is based on comparing the actual change, f of xk plus 1 minus f of xk, to the change that's predicted by our quadratic model. And if the quadratic model is accurate, then we can expand the trust radius. Otherwise, we can contract it. And when we're close to a minimum, rk should be large enough to allow full Newton steps. And therefore, we should eventually see quadratic convergence. So Newton's method can be highly effective for optimization in some cases, but it has some drawbacks. It can be unreliable, and it can only converge when we're sufficiently close to a minimum. It can be expensive, and the Hessian can be dense in general, and will be very expensive to compute if n is large, since we have n squared terms. And it can also be complicated, because sometimes for certain problems it can be impractical or laborious to calculate the Hessian explicitly. And because of this, there's much interest in quasi-Newton methods that don't require the Hessian, and we'll take a look at these in the next video.